Hello everyone and 2023 is coming to an end. So as a yearly tradition, I want to talk about all of the things that we have reviewed throughout this whole year. So for this year, we have reviewed a total of 38 different devices ranging from slant phones, tablets, foldable phones, flippable phones and also smartwatches. So 26 of them are phones, so uh, 5 of them are tablets, 2 of them are foldable phones and 3 of them are flippable phones and then 2 of them are smartwatches. These are just all of these daily tech stuff. I have not talked about things like gaming controllers, earplugs, earbuds, monitors, tablets, laptops, not, no, not tablets, as in, you know, those, those convertible Windows tablets. Yeah, I have not even talked about those. These are just Android devices in general, more like. I will leave the whole list of what we're gonna talk about in the description below so you can have a look at it for yourself. So let's just talk about slap phones first. Out of 26 of them, here is the entire chronological order of what we have reviewed for this whole year. And I would have to say we started off this year really strongly. We have the Vivo X90, the Galaxy S23 Ultra and also the OnePlus 11. These are three amazing phones from three different companies. So it's exciting to see that right at the start of the year, we already have such strong competition in the high-end smartphone market. So between these three phones, I would have to say all of them are exceeding my expectations. But of course, I would have to say the S23 Ultra is one of the best for the year. Same goes for the OnePlus 11. Even though these two phones are considered flagship, I would consider them to be in different leagues because the S23 Ultra just offers a lot more features like USB 3, Samsung DeX, all of those stuff. Um, OnePlus 11 doesn't have all of those. So the price of these phones do reflect that as well. So that's why I'm saying that they are in their own different leagues, but they are still one of the best of this year, but within their own leagues. And then we move on further down the year, we have the S23, S23 Plus. Um, S23, the small one is a weird phone because it is still one of the rare dying breeds. Um, yeah, small flagship phones are just dying year by year. And I'm glad to see Samsung is still offering the small phone worldwide that is readily available. You can go to the store right now and get uh, one S23 for yourself. So that's good. Then for the S23 Plus, it's not a bad phone. It's just badly priced. So if you get that during a discount, then I'm okay with it. Moving down the year, we also have the Galaxy A34. Now, this phone was surprising. As far as I remember, it uses the Dimensity 1080 chipset, if I'm not wrong. I can't really remember the specs of that phone. But that phone actually performed a lot better than expected. And uh, I'm, I'm just surprised by that, actually. Then, moving down further, we have the Redmi Note 12 Pro Plus 5G. This is also one of the best for the year because of its price to performance ratio. And the cameras are also quite good, but it's not the best. So. Yeah, for a mid-range smartphone, it's really good. Immediately after that, we have the ROG Phone 7 Ultimate. Uh, I would have to say the default winner for gaming phone this year is definitely going to be ROG Phone because that's the only one that we tried this year. Now, this one is, uh, I would have to say, it's quite a sad story because as we have known for the past few years, we have two major brands within the gaming smartphone industry. So we have... ROG phone and also Black Shark. But uh, since late last year, Black Shark has been um, getting itself in trouble and then the whole company just poof. They didn't actually release any new phones for this entire year. And the Black Shark 6 was, you know, the prototype was sold in the, I wouldn't say black market. I think it's Alibaba or something like that. But anyway, yeah, things don't look good for the company right now. And I really hope Black Shark will return because currently we only have uh, Vivo's IQ and also the ROG phone. Black Shark is gone. And then immediately after that, we also got the Poco F5 Pro. Now, the Poco F5 Pro, as usual, the Poco F series, they're going to offer the best specs for the lowest price possible. And of course, they're going to cut some corners to make that price happen. So if you are okay with what the Poco F5 Pro offers, then it's a fantastic phone, especially if you just want to play games like uh, this, Genshin Impact. Yeah, the Poco F5 Pro is definitely one of the 
phones with the best specs for the price that you're paying. And then a few months later, we have the OnePlus Nord 3 5G. Now that phone is surprisingly good. I thought the OnePlus Nord series is supposed to be, you know, very mid-range, a bit overpriced like last year's OnePlus Nord 2. But this year, the OnePlus Nord 3, it managed to surprise me in many ways. Firstly, the phone's camera is actually very good. And secondly, the performance, thanks to the MediaTek Dimensity 8200, if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember the specs, but anyway, that phone, surprisingly good. For the price you're gonna pay for, it's slightly higher than what Xiaomi Poco has to offer, but you get a more holistic experience. So that's also one of the more highly recommended phones of the year. Then immediately one day after that, uh, well, my uh, review release schedule is really tight. The Oppo Reno 10 Pro Plus. Uh, Reno's naming scheme is not that good, but uh, this phone, the Reno 10 Pro Plus, is actually exceeding my expectation as well. It comes with the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, if I'm not wrong. I really can't remember all of the specs of all of these phones. There are just way too many of them. And um, yeah, this phone is also very good, but the price is way too high. Actually, the entire Reno series is always expensive so there's that then we move down to a few more months later the xiaomi 13t pro okay if i'm not wrong this is using the mediatek dimensity 9200 if i'm not wrong 9200 plus yes that chipset is amazing real good the performance is actually competing with the 8 gen 2 in a way but it is not as efficient as the snapdragon counterparts so there's that in terms of performance MediaTek managed to catch up, so I would have to say if they're gonna keep up improving their chipsets, then I would have to say MediaTek is going to put on some serious competition to the Snapdragon supremacy. Should I even call that? Yeah, technically now everyone when they buy a phone, they'll be like, hey, I want a Snapdragon chipset smartphone. But I really hope MediaTek challenges that. Then moving down further, we have the TCL 40 Next Paper 5G. Now, this phone is interesting because of the Next Paper part. You see, the Next Paper is technically a matte finish on the screen itself. So, this screen is perfect for those who want to read with their devices. They also have a tablet version of it, but we didn't manage to try it. And I would have to say a tablet would match this kind of screen even better. Then moving down further, the oh Samsung Galaxy S23 FE. That phone is not bad. I managed to finally try out the Exynos 2200 chipset, which was last year's flagship smartphone. It's not a bad chipset after all. It's just that for whatever reason, the my particular unit is not that stable. I just don't know why. Other than that, I have to say that phone is quite good. The cameras are good, the ecosystem features, the USB port is a USB 3.0 Type-C and then you have Samsung DeX, all of those flagship features. It's just that the price is <laughs> way too much as what we have mentioned in our review for the S23 FE. Yeah, Samsung immediately released the phone and then they have a major discount. And after that, we have three more phones, the Honor X90, A79 5G and also the Poco C65. Now, all of these three phones are within the not so high end part. The X9B is actually expensive for what I would have to say, but the durability and also the 365 days back and front crack protection thing is worth the extra money that you're paying for, especially if you're clumsy. And then for the uh, Poco C65, which is right here, I haven't even packed it up yet. The Poco C65, yeah, 499 ringgit, the best deal that you can get for that price. So there's that. And moving on to tablets. So in July, we have the Xiaomi Pad 6. This is a continuation of the Xiaomi Pad 5. Once again, you get the older flagship chipsets in a tablet. And the screen, the performance, everything is real good out of this tablet, especially the price. And no other tablets within this price range can beat it. However, of course, MIUI and all of the functionalities are lacking for a tablet for example the keyboard the pencil the stylus they do have one but uh, it's not as good as samsung's s pen so there's that then immediately after that we have the samsung galaxy tab s9 ultra 
Now, this is the absolute biggest and best Android tablet that you can buy right now because of its Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset. Very big 14.2 inch screen as far as I remember. It's a very beautiful, humongous screen, but uh, it's not really recommended if you want to play touchscreen games and whatnot because of its size and all of the button placements are just very difficult to use unless your game is compatible with an external controller. Uh, it's a good tablet but it's not that I will recommend it to everyone. You can get the uh, Galaxy Tab S9, the non-Ultra variant. The small one is quite good, even the Plus is actually quite good. It, the Ultra is just the size that's uh, too big. And then we reviewed two more tablets, uh, there's nothing particularly special. And then we have the Galaxy Tab S9 FE Plus. Now, this tablet is not bad. It's a mid-range tablet, but uh, the price of this tablet is something that I think it's very difficult to swallow. So, as what I have placed on the Google Sheet here, recommended during a discount. So, yeah, I would have to say, you need to get quite a substantial discount before I can start recommending this tablet. Then we will move on to foldable phones. Yes, we review a total of two of them this year, the Oppo Find N3 and also the Galaxy Z Fold 5. Now, both of these two phones are good in their own regards, so they do have their own list of pros and cons. And uh, I wouldn't say I would recommend one over the other. It ultimately boils down to your own personal preference, like what I've said in my full comparison between these two phones. Link at the top right corner there if you want to check it out. I did say that I like the Galaxy Z Fold 5 a bit more because it suits my personal usage and I think the software on Samsung's part is just better and every time I pick up a phone, I will interact with the software. So yeah, I picked that over the Oppo Find N3. As for flippable phones, this is gonna be a bit difficult to talk about because as you can see here, we have two Oppo Find N whatever flip series here. The first one is the Find N2 flip, then the second one is the Z Flip 5, and then we got the Find N3 flip. So you can see the time gap between the Find N2 and the Find N3 flip is only like about seven months. Um, yeah, their release cycle was way too fast this year. And uh, the Find N3 flip isn't that big of an upgrade over the Find N2 flip. They just added OIS to the main camera which is uh it, it should have been in the fine n2 because it's such a basic feature that every phone should have nowadays and for the galaxy z flip 5 that's a major improvement over its predecessor i would have to say the larger cover display and the software revolving around that cover display has improved a lot as in the user experience and uh, i would just have to say it's just a very big leap forward for samsung's galaxy z flip series is it still a recommended phone though? Mm, kind of depends on you. If you are ready to go into the foldable or flippable phone form factor, then go for it. So as for smartwatches, we have revealed a total of two of them. And uh, I would only consider watches that are using Wear OS to be smartwatches. I don't know how you want to define a smartwatch, but for me, if it runs Wear OS or Apple's whatever Wear OS, then those are real smartwatches. So we reviewed the Galaxy Watch 6 Classic 47mm, the one that I'm wearing here. It has a rotating bezel. Yes, Samsung brought back the rotating bezel, actually has good battery life. For me, it consistently lasts for two days with one single charge. So that's actually very good. As for the Xiaomi Watch 2 Pro that we reviewed uh, quite recently actually, that is also a very good competitor to Samsung's smartwatches. Um, all of the features available on the Xiaomi Watch 2 Pro is also usable on non-Xiaomi phones, which is real good. It's just that the uh, Do Not Disturb Sync doesn't actually work for me, so maybe that's a software bug, I'm not sure. Uh, the price of the Xiaomi Watch 2 Pro is also very competitive. It's right around the Galaxy Watch 6 Classic price range, if I'm not wrong. So yeah, it's good to see more competition in the Wear OS market. So we have gone through the whole list of what we have reviewed this year. So I want to talk about a few points, starting with the positives. I have a total of five points here. I would have to say the biggest winner this year is going to be Oppo and OnePlus. The Hasselblad collaboration and also formidable foldable devices in the market right now is just going to show the world that they are actually competent and they can make 
real good devices. Of course, they still need to improve in terms of both software and also remove a lot of the bloatware, especially on Oppo's part. And also they need to be more transparent or at least have some more integrity in terms of some things like uh, IP rating. Because as you can see, I made a big deal out of the Oppo Find Entry's official video where they show the phone getting splashed with water, but there isn't an official IP rating for that phone. And yeah, as mentioned earlier, we started off this year really strongly. We have three different amazing phones from three different bands and competition is always good. And then the third point for the positives is foldables are getting more exciting this year thanks to the arrival of the Oppo Find N3 or the OnePlus Open. Yeah, I have to admit, having more competition in the foldable market is gonna be kicking each other's ass to improve their own devices. So particularly to Samsung, you need to improve, especially the cameras on the Galaxy Z Fold series. And then my fourth positive point here is that MediaTek's chipset is getting better year over year. Thanks to the Xiaomi 13T Pro that we have reviewed, like I don't know, a few months ago, link at the top right corner there. The performance coming out of that Dimensity 9200 Plus chipset is amazing. It's not as efficient as the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, but more competition is always better. And my last positive point is regarding iPhones. So the iPhone 15 series is finally using USB-C, which has a big impact on Android users as well because we can finally get to share all of the accessories between Android devices and also iPhones. This is important because I think accessory makers can finally just focus their attention on one single design that is compatible for all devices. So accessories like the GameSir G8 Galileo or the, uh, what's that again, the Easy SMX M10. Those game controller grips are gonna be compatible between two devices, iPhones, Androids. This is a big deal. As for negatives, I just have to nitpick that uh, some of the phone series naming schemes are just confusing as heck. For example, the Redmi Note 12 series. I don't know how many variants are there within that one Redmi Note 12 series. I remember there's the Redmi Note 12 4G, 5G, Redmi Note 12 Pro Plus, then the Pro Plus 5G. I don't know, it's way too confusing. Same goes to Oppo Reno. Why is the Oppo Reno 8T 5G placed like this and then the Oppo Reno 8Z is also stylized like this and not the other way around? I don't know. It's just very confusing and I just, I just want to type it however I want. But that's not good for SEO, right? And then for gaming phones, yeah, um, that is one negative point because uh, gaming phone market is going to be slightly more stagnant than before because of Black Shark's departure, should I put it that way? Yeah, and the third negative point is that uh, small flagship smartphones are still a rare thing to have because I think everyone who buys a premium phone, if they're going to pay the price, they want a bigger screen and that is why small flagship smartphones are just not, not doing that well right now actually for a few years already and then oh this is a big point the last negative point is uh, something that I want to highlight really big here RAM expansion extension or RAM plus whatever you're gonna call it or even virtual RAM for that matter which is the real name of it by the way that is still a very bad feature so you should disable it when you get a new phone link at the top right corner there so you can watch that video to know why this kind of RAM expansion extension feature is not good for your phone. Then a few more personal thoughts that I just want to share out. Um, Apple's chipset is getting more and more powerful by the year. As we can see the M1, M2 and M3 chips are just amazing even for the iPad 5th gen, iPad Air 5th gen. I'm still using this tablet despite it being like a year and a half old at this point because the M1 chip within this tablet is just so good. Even the MacBook Pro that I'm using behind me is nearly two years old now. And uh, yeah, it is using the M1 Pro chip. It's still performing really well and does whatever I want it to do right now. And speaking of Apple, I need to admit, I still have not used an iPhone as my daily driver before. Yes, never. I have never owned an iPhone and I have never used an iPhone as my daily driver. That's it. I do want to change that next year perhaps or maybe sometime soon. 
uh, Apple, if you're watching this, do send me an iPhone. Yay. I don't think that will happen, but one can hope, right? <laughs> and I think we should also focus more on efficiency and software of the devices that we are using, not just purely focusing on performance. This is important because we can see a lot of phones, if they're not optimized or bad software for that matter, then yeah, you're gonna lose out on performance or even just having a lot of bloatware that can also affect your performance as well. And I also think all phone brands should adapt USB PD, as in the USB power delivery protocol or USB PD PPS or programmable power supply for cross compatibility between all devices for fast charging. For example, Apple, Samsung, laptops, actually all laptops that are charging using USB-C are using USB PD standards. However, some brands like Oppo, Xiaomi, Vivo, Realme, yeah, they're all using different charging standards. They are not cross compatible between each other and if you want to fast charge, you have to bring their own charger and cable to be able to fast charge, which is why I'm calling it proprietary fast charging standard. I don't like it, so I do just wish more brands to use USB PD standard. Even ROG phone for that 65 watt charging is actually using USB PD, which is real good. So I can just unplug my laptop's charger, plug into the ROG phone, and then I can get fast charging. Convenient, right? Why can't other brands do that? I don't know. And uh, the biggest lesson that I learned this year is actually thanks to our writer. He said that there is nothing called a bad phone. It's just a phone with a very bad price. I have to agree. If a phone is priced just right, then yeah, you can sell it no matter how bad it is. For example, I know I shouldn't do this, but the Galaxy S23 FE, like what I said earlier, is not a bad phone. It's actually quite a good phone, but the price is way too high. So if Samsung lowered the price to somewhere around 2000 ringgit Malaysia, which I think is a much more reasonable price for that phone, then it immediately becomes a quote unquote good phone. Yeah, it's just the price that matters. It's not the overall phone performance and whatnot that matters. There are rarely bad phones in the market nowadays actually. So yeah, that's it. That's all we have to share with you for the year 2023. We will still have a few more videos for the month of December. So remember to check it out and uh, do subscribe when you wanna go down there and comment in this video. Do remember to hit like and subscribe. Yeah, we'll see you guys in the next video. I'm tired. The reason why I'm filming in my room is because our office upstairs, they're doing some Bitcoin mining and then the entire building's electricity fuse just burned. So yeah, I have to do it at home.